Hello. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Love and greetings from Pastor Jose, who is uh, still in the land, finishing some work. He sends his love and greetings to all of you. Shall we bow down before we speak the word? We thank you, almighty God, creator of the heavens and earth. For you are the Lord of hosts and the mighty one of Israel. You deserve all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. And we are so grateful for the freedom you've given us to hear the word of God in this nation, Lord. To read the word of God in this nation, Father. And to speak it with love and boldness. It is by your grace. And we want to honor you and bless you, Father. I pray, Almighty God, that whosoever hears these words, their hearts will be open, that you may write with your finger of fire your precepts, the very words that that person needs to hear to advance and to grow. I pray that every ear shall be open to hear and to listen to your word, and every eye shall be open even as your word go forth, to see in images that which you are speaking unto man. And let your name be exalted and glorified. Father, I pray that as your word go forth, you have said that your word sets us free. And when we are free, we are free indeed. So I pray that you set up your angels, Lord God, that will be cutting by your word every chain in the mind and in the heart of whomsoever is listening to this word. And that the sword of the Spirit will penetrate deeply into the heart, circumcising, separating what is of the word, what is of the Spirit, and what is from the soul for your eternal glory in Jesus name and we all say Amen well as I was seeking the Lord of what to share today the Lord reminded me that on the 31st of December the last day of the year we were waiting many believers were waiting with me in this church upstairs, praying and prepared to receive the new year in the presence of God. And so we received also the new year in prayer and waiting in the Lord. But prior to that, the Lord, as I inquired of him, has shown me some things that would happen for 2018 and this was according to the value of the numbers 7 and 8 so when the Lord said that he will reveal some things he would do in 2018 according to the value of the number 7 and the number 8 I thought huh, where do I begin <laughs> So I searched, what does it mean, number seven? What does it mean, number eight? I searched for the value. And so I found that number seven represents divine completeness. There was seven days when the Lord created the earth. And the seventh day was the, se the day where all was completed and he entered into rest. So the Lord was saying to me that along this line, he's preparing the believers to enter into his rest 
to be completed spiritually. That then they may be able to enter through the gates of what he's going to do. Valued number eight. So let's look at what number eight was in the search that I did. Number eight is in Hebrew the number called Shmone. From the root word Shamein. It means to make fat. It means to cover with fat. And as a noun, it means superabundance of oil. I said, okay, let's look more. What does this mean? A seven was called because the seventh day was the day of completion and rest. So eight was the eighth day. The day after the seventh day. The day after the rest that God is bringing his people into. So number eight means over and above the divine completeness of God in man. Well, I never thought there was something greater than the divine completeness of God's plan in my life. But it seems as if there is divine completeness. So dear beloved, there is something very exciting to hope for as the year 2018 begins to develop. Of course, the eighth day of the week is also the first day of the next week. So what does that mean? It means that eighth day is the beginning of a new cycle in your life. It's the beginning of new era in your life. It's the beginning of a change. It's a new chapter of your life yet to be written by the hand of God. If you will only lend the empty pages to the Lord, he will write the new chapter of your life. The Lord put in my heart, and if you only will let go at your past, he will write in the tablets of your heart and your mind your future. You will begin to walk in what God has destined you to walk. That's wonderful. The number eight is especially associated with resurrection and regeneration. Two words. Say in your heart, resurrection and regeneration. The start of this chapter is the start of a new era, not only for the believers, but for the whole wide world. Accordingly to 2 Peter 2, verse 5, and chapter 3, verse 20, Noah was the eighth person in the ark who passed through the floods into the new generation, into this new world that God has planned after the flood. The world was regenerated, cleansed by the flood. And Noah and his family were exactly eight. 
That means after the completion of the world that God created, he brings the flood and then he gives a superabundance of newness through eight people. We find also that the firstborn was decreed by God to be circumcised on the eighth day, according to Exodus 22, verse 30. So the firstborn of the cattle and every animal and every human was to be circumcised on the eighth day. Superabundance. This was reflecting the hard circumcision that God will bring through Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit into humankind. Resurrection. Jesus resurrected on the first day, which means the first day after a week is the eighth day. After completion, after all that God decreed through Moses for man to be cleansed and purified, God causes the Lord Jesus to resurrect from the dead, to bring humankind the victory over death, superabundant life, not just life. Superabundant life. What a hope. What a wonderful things to hold into. The eighth day also is represented in the day of transfiguration. Because it happened on the eighth day after the announcement of Christ's suffering. And it was demonstrating the glory of God that was to come into man with this manifested as a holy bride for Christ Jesus in these last days. So number eight is telling us of the glory that God is beginning from this year onward to release on man whosoever is willing will walk in that glory. <coughs> so what is going on? God is releasing his authority to the ones who are uncompromisingly obedient to him. What, <coughs> what does it mean to be uncompromisingly obedient? It only starts with the written word of God. If we practice doing what God shows us in the word of God, we are strengthening our limbs to walk, obeying the voice of God. Because the written word is God talking, is it not? He has said, this is my word. Jesus Christ is the word. He was with God and he was God. Therefore, we know that whatsoever the Lord has caused by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to be written in the Bible, coming from the Aramaic, coming from the scrolls. I'm not talking about the diluted, reformed, and transformed translations that are feeding the Christians according to the flesh. I'm talking about the original. Word of God. Then, 
will begin to walk in obedience with God. Because the word of God tells us that the word will cause love to be perfected in us. And isn't it true that when we love somebody, we are willing to do just about anything for that person? How many of us agree with that? Yes. If not, ask somebody that is madly in love. Ask them, are you willing to do just about anything? But above all, the love of God has a great deal of more power than the love of man. So that's what the Lord was showing me, that it will begin to happen in year 2018. So, in other words, God is working to make himself shine and manifested in his power, in his light, and in his glory through human beings. Just as Jesus was, so were men created for. Just as Jesus is now risen and glorified, so are you, says the word of God. So in Matthew 7, 29, says this, for he was teaching as one who had and was authority and not as did the scribes. This word is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. How did he walk upon this earth? He walked with humility, but in between and in the midst of his humility, he walked with authority. He was not a show-off. He didn't have to because he knew who he was. He knew who he is. But he walked in authority and with authority. And so it was a great comparison of his walk and his life with the scribes. In 2 Corinthians 10 verse 8 says this, For though I should glory somewhat abundantly concerning our authority, which the Lord gave for the building up of yourself and not for casting you down, I shall not be put to shame. What is he saying? The apostle saying, I have been given authority to build you up and not to put you down. And because of this authority that I have, I will not be put to shame. I'm not ashamed of having this authority. Can we say that? Are we willing to say that the day that that authority is flowing from us? Because when you walk in the authority of the living God, there is opposition. And when we are opposed, that's when we need to manifest that authority without being ashamed of who we are and whom we represent. Many will be threatened in their lives. What will we do? This is the Lord God who dwells within us, the one that is going to give us the grace to stand firm to the end. We cannot stand in our own strength, can we? We cannot do it. Our flesh is not enough. Our own understanding and reasoning is not enough. We need the power, the glory, the light, the wisdom, the truth of the living God, 
Christ Jesus. Through the Holy Spirit, we can stand even as unto death if needed. This authority is an authority that God is waiting for man to say, yes, I claim. It's the authority of God in man. Jesus came to give us that authority through his sacrifice. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 6, it says, Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We cannot, we cannot war against the enemy, against temptations, against sin with our own flesh. Because our flesh in itself is an enmity to God. So, how can the flesh that is against God will fight against itself? Cannot be done. Can only be done in the Spirit of God. So, whatsoever you do, seek for the Spirit of God. Seek that the Spirit of God comes in, dwells in, and takes over. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are mighty and they are powerful before God for the casting down of a strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that is exalted against the knowledge of God. So if you, wherever you are, have had troubles with things that hold you strongly, that you want them out of your life, but you cannot let go. God is giving you weapons. All you have to do is ask God for the weapons of your warfare to be released from heaven and to destroy the strongholds. Hallelujah. Let it be done unto you even right now. Let all the strongholds in your life be broken and every chain destroyed. For that is the will of God. That man should be free. These weapons of warfare, they are not of the flesh. They are no earthly weapons. Forget about guns and swords and knives and this and that to fight around. You need a lot more than that. A lot more than that. Wherever you are, your gun, will not, your gun and your rifles will not save you. If you haven't got the word of God in your mouth that will paralyze your enemy, I can guarantee you'll be saved. For salvation comes from the Lord and the Lord alone. And no man can come to the Father and his heavenly kingdom except through Christ Jesus. Whatever other means you searched, Cannot save. Casting down imaginations. Is there anyone that whenever they sit down, these thoughts come, these images come, you want to get them out of your mind. You've seen something on TV. You've seen something somewhere in the streets. Something that has affected you. And you see these gruesome things. You're not welcoming them. You are not calling for them. But they just come. These imaginations. Well, I tell you, the weapons of warfare that God has for you and for me will destroy and cast down all those imaginations. God wants to sanctify 
Make holy and pure your imaginations. Why? Because your imagination is not for the devil to access and all the demons. It's for God to speak to you. You know, it's funny. Many believers are so afraid of imaginations. It's amazing how the new age people have worked on that. And believers are even afraid of it when we are the ones given such inheritance. God loves everyone. So every imagination that it doesn't align itself with the goodness of God, with the deliverance that is in the blood of Christ Jesus, with the abundant life that he has given, those imaginations can be cast down by the weapons of our warfare. Calling God, calling God to be the one that dictates everything in our life and brings forth the weapons of our warfare from heaven to the earth, from heaven to your situation. Sometimes we go and battle and fight this and fight that in our own strength. Fight that, fight things the best way we can. But let me tell you, dear brothers and sisters, the best way we can fight is when we let God do the fight. And love, and love, and love. You know what? I remember when my heart and my mind were bound up with darkness. Maybe this is what's happened to some of you. Anybody that talked about love, I felt so uncomfortable. I thought, oh, not again, that thing. Oh, not again. I used to feel that these love things had nothing to do with me. I used to feel that this was a hard thing, like a hard pill to swallow. This was like far away from me. This is what darkness and sin does to the heart of man. We desperately want to love. We desperately want to receive love. We look for love in, in everything that is in this world. And we can't find it. Because you know what? Even the, the greatest love you have in this world, your spouse, your fiancé, or whoever is, your mother, your father, their love is imperfect. Unless the Lord Jesus Christ has entered into that life and the Holy Spirit is pouring his love towards you from them. There is no greater love than the love of God. No greater love. So dear beloved, seek love. Not the love that man can give, but the love of God. Continuing with this scripture in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 to 6, it says, and every casting down all imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. How many times have we been encountered with circumstances, people, or writings, or books, or doctrines that come against the knowledge of God for us? To every man sometime in their life, we will encounter doctrines, philosophies. We will encounter situations and people that will try to move us away from knowing God, the creator of heaven and earth. Therefore, my beloved, God has given us the weapons of our warfare to cast down, 
to tear down and to destroy everything that is sold itself against the knowledge of God. All we need to do, go, go forth. He said, Lord, send forth the weapons of our warfare and destroy these things that are trying to take away from me the knowledge of you. And God will do it. Because he says so. And then bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What does that mean? How do I bring all my thoughts to obedience? To captivity to the obedience of Christ Jesus. Captivity that means bound, attached. Well, if we are going to be free, we might have been free under the bondage of love with Christ Jesus rather than to the world. Because the world tells you, be free. Do whatever you want. Is that freedom? No. You become bound to habits that are harmful to you. You become bound to circumstances and things that they are not profitable for you. But to be bound to the Lord who will make you into his likeness, who will release his authority upon this earth, cause you to shine like a star, then it's worth to be bound, is it not? So sometimes our thoughts will go wild. We see somebody passing by and we are looking at the way they are dressed and the thoughts begin to go in a way that is not profitable to us or to somebody else. There goes a man that sees a cleavage and his thoughts go to a way of his own destruction. Another person sees the car that he likes or she likes the most and allows his or her mind to go to covetousness and even desire to steal it. Those thoughts don't come from God. But how we put them into captivity? By the power of the weapons of our warfare that are not carnal. The weapons of our warfare have no, no connection whatsoever with those kind of thoughts. So we can say clearly, as we get knowledgeable of the word of God, we can say, that thought is not from you, Lord. That is from the pit of hell. And today I call upon the weapons of my warfare to destroy all those thoughts. And I cast them out. I remember in, in a meeting of women, the Lord gave this word. We was inspired by a wonderful saint. When a thought is not according to the word of God, it doesn't give glory to God, it's not wholesome to another person, it's not a thought that will lift them up, that thought is not from God. So what you ought to do is imagine that thought as an ugly little creature that's crept in into your mind. Pick them up from the neck. Open the door of your mind. Cast them out and close the door. And say, no more of you. Yes. It may seem childish. But it's effective. The Lord is calling us to have our minds searched, scanned, for thoughts that are not from God. Ungodly thoughts defile the vessel. Ungodly thought corrupt the mind. Ungodly thoughts cloud the eyes of the believers and make the ears dull. So 
So one of the things that God is doing is teaching us how to be wise with the thoughts that the enemy brings to our mind. So God is preparing a generation, you, you, for these last days. How do we ought to be in 2018 to be able to walk in this power and authority that God is so keen on releasing to his believers? Well, the characteristic of these believers is spoken in the word of God. They manifest unselfish and compassionate heart of giving, giving of themselves and of that which they have been given by God. Let's face it. The word of God says that the the world is God's and everything in it. The earth belongs to God. The silver, the gold, everything in the earth belongs to God. And the world belongs to God. And all the inhabitants thereof, whether it be insects, reptiles, fish, or human beings, whether they believe or don't believe, it doesn't matter, they all belong to God. So your wealth is not yours, it's God's. Your anointing is not yours, it's God's. Your gifting is not yours, it's God's. That's good news. Because if somebody gets offended about your gifting and your anointing and the word of God flowing from you, it's not your problem, it's God's. Amen. That quickly gets rid of offenses, you know. You don't have to stop loving somebody that says nonsense to you because of what God has caused you to speak or to do. Because it's God speaking. So you don't need to take, we don't need to take it on board. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6 to 15 says this. If we can go to the scriptures with this. I am reading from the American version. By this I say, he that sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. And he that sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Let each man do according to what he has purpose in his heart. No gradually or of necessity, for God loves the cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound unto you, that you having always sufficiency in everything may abound unto every good Work. Again, we are into the word abound and superabound. Now, Jesus gave everything. Everything. He gave his blood, he gave his body, he gave his wisdom, he gave his word. And he's giving his glory. Hmm. He is releasing glory. Verse 10. Oh, sorry, verse 9. And it is written, He hath scattered abroad, He has given to the poor, His righteousness abides forever. And he that supplies seeds to the sower and bread for the food shall supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the fruit of your righteousness. Dear beloved, let me tell you this. If we want superabundance blessings, start giving blessings. 
If you want super abundant strength, start strengthening the brethren. If you want super abundant health, start praying for the sick. Give and you shall receive. As you freely given, who gives a health? Who gives a strength? Who gives salvation? Who gives deliverance? Who gives everything that we have? Some people said the sweat of my forehead. Oh, yes. And who lets you do it? Who gives you grace to work hard? Is God, whether we believe on it or not. Is he who gives the strength? Is he who gives the wisdom? The thing is sometimes we are so disconnected that we think it's our wisdom. Let the world know that all the developments and all the scientific findings, they are all allowed by the Lord. Verse 11. Ye being enriching every thing unto all liberality which works through us. Thanksgiving to God. You know, when we start exercising the giving of our time, oh, our time is so valuable, isn't it? Our sleeping hours, oh, that is so valuable, isn't it? When we start giving our own bodies to serve God. When we start giving out of the very little we may have because somebody has less than us. When we start giving to God more than what he decrees, we will receive far more than we can Imagine. You see, this feeling, oh no, but I may lack. Oh no, I may not have enough sleep. Oh no, I may not have enough hours of rest. Oh no, I may not have enough strength. That comes from the pit of hell, dear brothers and sisters. And it feels real. I tell you, I know when I feel tired. But I also remember that Jesus Christ also felt tired. Did he give up? Did he not? No. When he was insulted, he didn't insult back. That's how he's showing us. Never give up on doing good because he is good God and he's making us in his own image there is plenty of goodness inside of everyone plenty of goodness inside of you that he has put there all we need to do is let it come out because the fear of lack of anything comes from the pit of hell so we don't give abundantly because when we give that makes us legally right to receive a great, great harvest. Many of us pray, give me this, give me that, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. How much of our time are we giving? How much of our strength are we giving to God? Are we robbing God of his money, of his strength, of his time? You know, many years ago, when I was learning, I was asking God always to teach me about everything. So one day he wanted to teach me a lesson, and he took me through the scriptures where he went to, the, to Gethsemane with some of the apostles, and then he said to them, wait there. And he went to pray to the Father, but he comes back after an hour, he sees them sleep. So he says, hey, you know, can't you at least wait with me, pray with me for an hour? So he goes back for another hour. 
he comes back to sleep again same story is he hitting home for some of us you know what the third time he comes and finds the same thing and i said yes lord i get your point i can relate to that what else are you teaching me he says yes that is the right point but i'm trying to teach you something else i said what is that he says you remember that in the times of the patriarchs i speak of 10% tithes i said yeah i keep my tithes lord he says yes 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 i know but how many hours are there in a day and i think i didn't understand what he was coming to i said 24 hours lord he said 2 hours and 40 minutes belong to me how many of that are you giving me oh i wasn't i thought that tithe was just giving that little bit of money but god says you're not giving me my tithes oh so i said lord help me he says i'm not finished with this remember in the scripture i speak of tithes and offerings when the people of israel gave their tithes and their offerings he says tithe is the 10 percent but the offering is on top of that oh really he says the minimum i require of you is three hours a day in my presence minimum Well, I wasn't doing it at that time, so it was a great lesson. God teaches lessons, so encourage us to do His will. Then if I don't do, then I'm not being obedient. Then I'm not walking with Him. I'm only hearer of the Word of God, but not a doer, right? So knowing that, I started. Oh, some days were very hard. I'm tired, Lord, I'm tired. <laughs> Hallelujah. But he gave us the weapon of our warfare to fight a good fight against these things. I'm not speaking of religious activities and religious legalistic things. I'm talking about things that come from the conviction of a heart that wants to please God rather than self. Okay. So we know that when we give unto God whatsoever he requires, whether it be our car. I remember too, the Lord one day said, would you give your car to so and so? Mm, I had to think about it. Because that car was my 60th birthday present from the Lord. <laughs> and I was so blessed i used to let my hair lay on on the wheel with thanksgiving in my heart for the love and generosity of god and now he asking me to give my car because the lord asked you to give your car hmm? some of you have been asked and some of you obeyed so i said yes lord whenever you want me this car is not mine, it belongs to you. Even though I paid for it, well actually I didn't pay for it. But even if I paid for it, Lord, that money came only through you. It's yours whenever you want. I will enjoy it as long as you want me to. When you want me to let go, I'll let go. That doesn't make me better than anybody else. It's just a test to see because God says he tests the hearts of men to see whether my heart is in line with his or to see whether he still needs to work on me that I may become a doer not a listener or hearer of his word so he's working in all of us he's dealing with all of us but he promises 
that he will give abundantly to whomsoever is willing to give to him and to others what he requires of us. Whether that is time, money, prayers, tears, help. For the ministration, verse 12, for the ministration of this service not only fills up the measure of the want of the saints, but abounds also through many things given unto God. Seeing that through the proving of, your, of you by this ministration, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession unto the gospel of Christ and for the liberty of your contribution unto them and unto all. Verse 14, while they themselves also with supplication on your behalf long after you by reason of extending grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for this unspeakable gift. Our giving is for the edification of the saints. Whatsoever God gives us is not for us to get fatter. It's not for us to get smarter. It's not for us to live and eat and drink and rejoice the rest of our life. It's for us to give of what we shall receive. And to those that much has been given, much is required. So the more blessings you get, the more we ought to give. In tears, in blessings, in prayers, in time, in encouragement. Sometimes you see somebody that is needy. Go and give half of your food to them. It's a good exercise. That does not guarantee you heaven. But it guarantees you the blessings of God. Know that we should do, as many do practice, to give as a business transaction with God. That is not on. God cannot be fooled. He knows what is in the heart of man. And therefore we cannot say, well, I give you this or I give that because I expect you. No. We give because we have been given, not we because we expect to be given. Amen. Can I say it again? We give because we have been given, not because we expect to receive. Let that deception be broken from the body of Christ that is going rampant. That is a teaching that is bringing people to utter deception. If we don't give from the heart, it means nothing. We ought to read and meditate. In chapter 13 of the book of Corinthians, that it speaks about love. That kind of love can be just the sound of symbols. You know, what we do from the heart for others touches the heart of God. And what we do for God in others touches the heart of the Father. So think of this. We do not live for ourselves anymore. We live for God. I have read about the Hebrew people. Whenever they are faced with challenge, and I don't know, I haven't searched whether this is for real or not, so for all the Hebrew people, if I'm wrong, please forgive me. But you know what? It sounds perfect. I've been shown that the Hebrew people, when they're faced with troubles, they recite this word, 
Thou shalt love the Lord with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. So whenever they're in trouble, they tell their souls, love the Lord with all of your heart. Love the Lord with all of your soul. Your intellect, your emotions, and your will. And that word gives them power to go through. How many of us know that by the power of God, such a tiny nation has defeated the biggest foes that ever encountered? How many wars God had made him win because they said, Thou shalt love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all of your strength. And if it's, that is not what they've been saying, you know what is a very good thing for us to say? Because whatever is a challenge, if I say, Lord, I love you, and I'm going to love you with my heart, I'm not going to let my heart go for myself, self-pity and whatever else. I'm not going to love you with my uh, uh, flesh. I'm going to love you with all my soul. That my mind will go all for you. That my emotions will be only for you. That my will be only for you. I need your grace, Lord, but I love you. I'm going to do this that is something possible for me because I love you. And because I trust that you give me the power to do that which you ask me of. Amen. This is a key for the overcomers. Whenever in troubles, whenever you find yourself with temptation that a flesh wants to take you that way, remember, it's an enemy to God. So he will always try to take you away from what God is best wishes for you. The moment the flesh wants to go this way, you say, I love you, Lord. And because I love you, I say no to that. Because I love you, I will not go there. Because I love you, I will not say that. Because I love you, I will not walk that way. And the strength come forth. You know, I heard a song a while ago. I don't know the song, but one thing is stuck in my heart. And in the song says, you made me worship that I may love you. Huh. So the more we say to God that we love him and we allow our heart to be participant of that, the more we will love him. Now this kind of people, which is you and you and everyone that is willing to receive that power of God upon their lives for this end time completion of God's plans, they forsake backbiting. They forsake gossiping. They forsake murmuring, self-pity, and criticism. These things are very familiar with every one of us because we learn these things from a very young age with some exceptions. So I say, my dear beloved, is it possible to forsake backbiting? Is it? You see, there is one key. If you want to stop answering back to the people of authority, answering back with harsh words, bite your lip, not the back of people. Bite your lip. You know, not a word will come out of your mouth. You try to say something, bite in your lips and see how well you will speak. So when backbiting wants to come, bite your lips. Amen. Gossiping. Gossiping is talking about others' shortcomings, whether real or not real. Oh, brother, let's pray, because you know what Mary did? She did, 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 did. What? Hmm. 
God might share his secrets about somebody with you when you have learned not to speak about people's sins and problems and shortcomings to another. Now, let's make this statement clear. Sometimes you need to go to somebody in authority to find the counsel of God through them. But most of the time, as it is said, we find that people, instead of going to the brother, oh, you know, I got hurt when you said this or when you did that. Please forgive me for having resentment against you or getting offended with you. And giving the chance to that person to ask for forgiveness. Dear beloved, we go and talk every Tom, Dick and Harry in the church, in the neighborhood, and if possible, in the media. Facebook, Twitter. About the sins of others. Without you having made reconciliation. It's totally against the word of God. I did that. And I suffer the consequences of being shut off from the presence of God. So if we want to walk in that power of God, we have to renounce that power of the devil. No gossiping. When the desire to talk about somebody's fault or to complain about somebody, bite your lips and say, Lord, because I love you with all of my heart, I will not lean in my own understanding. In all my ways that acknowledge you that you are in control, that you will look after this situation. And that you will lead me the way that I need to go through and the way I need to speak. So because of you, I will not gossip. Because I love you, I will not talk about my brother and sister's weaknesses. I will not talk about pastors of my church or pastors of other churches. I will not discuss the weaknesses of other churches. I will observe that I may not fall into the same thing. But I will not gossip. And you know what? The power is already inside of us. So there is hope. God this year is going to release the power for us to overcome all that. All these attitudes are enemies to us. <coughs> and I believe that God is going to put them as far as the east is from the west. And we'll be able to go forth. So don't focus in these things. Focus in the Lord. Focus in his light. And his light will remove every darkness from within. These people will not murmur. Because Jesus, regardless of what he was told or spoken of or done, did not say a word. Except when the heavenly father required him to do. So likewise, we can say, I love you, Lord. And because I love you with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind, I will not murmur. I know that whatever happens to me, you are in control. Just teach me. How to deal with every situation? What do I do with these circumstances? That rather than me pushing you to be my servant and to do for me instead of me for you. <laughs> Are we all okay? This is what these people will do. They will have no self-pity. Jesus did not feel sorry for himself. He knew what he was going to do. And he knew what he was born for. He was born to die for humanity. That humanity will live forever. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, 
There was no need for him to feel sorry for himself. Poor me, poor me. How many of us, while we are doing some work, we are considering in our mind, poor me, oh me, poor me, oh poor me. I've done it. You know what? It brings me further down. I get tired or sicker or whatever. More depressed. But when I say, no, I love my God. Because I love you. You give me the strength that I need. You give me the anointing that I need. I'm not going to focus in my body. I'm not going to focus in this carnality of mine. I'm going to focus in the God in whom all things are possible. I'm going to finish the task that God has given me. No matter what the cost. And the soldier begins to rise up within us. You know, We, we are called to speak life. In us and in others, we are called to speak love and truth that sets us free. But if possible, the devil can deceive us to speak negative stuff, defeating stuff, instead of victory. In Matthew 9 verse 4, it says, But Jesus, knowing, seeing their thoughts, said, Do you think... Why do you think evil and harbor malice in your heart? How did Jesus know? How did he know what they were thinking? You know what? Our thoughts are heard like with magnifying speakers in the heavenly realm. So whatever we have been thinking, everybody in heaven knows about it. And because Jesus, while being in the earth, remained in contact with God and heaven, he knew what was in the thoughts of the people, that their thoughts were evil and they had malice. They had bad intentions towards him. Matthew 9, verse 6. But in order that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins and remit the penalty, he then said to the paralyzed man, Get up. Pick up your sleeping bed and go to your own house. Jesus did this miracle to convict the hearts of those that was thinking evil towards him. And he healed the sick. That power is yours as you claim it for the coming year. That's for you. All you had to say, yes, Lord, I want it. Give me the grace that I need to walk in it. Send the weapons of our warfare to destroy everything that hinders that walk, to destroy everything that comes against my obedience to you. And tear down the rudiments of the flesh in my life. And as you promise in your word, allow me, O oh God, to receive the grace to will and to do what is God's good pleasure, not my pleasure. It's a natural thing to, 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 to push for what we like. Two people are working together. Oh, I think I'm going to do this way. Oh, no, no, I think that this way is better. No, but, but this one is better. What? What God says is what's better. The two people shook whole hands and say, Lord, which way you want it? Not my way, but your way. Because God's ways are better than our ways. The word of God tells us so. In James 3, chapter, uh, James chapter 3, verse 8 to 10, he says this. And this is regarding the malice and the evil thoughts of the people in their hearts. 
if we entertain them long enough, guess what happens? They come out of the mouth. Because the word of God says, out of the fullness of the heart, the mouth will speak. We won't be able to hold it. It will out of our mouth. So in verse 8 of James 3, it says, But the tongue can no man tame. It is restless, evil. It is full of deadly poison. They are with blessed we the Lord and Father, and therewith we curse men who are made out of the likeness of God. Verse 10. Out of the same mouth come forth blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. So God is very clear and specific. He says, no man can tame the tongue. So we can say, you can say, oh, well, if I can't tame my tongue, then how are you preaching to me that I should discipline it? How can I hold my tongue? How can I bite my lip? If God says that I cannot tame it. Simple. Because our mouths should be moved, inspired, anointed by the spirit of the living God not by our flesh because if we allow the mouth to speak what the feelings emotions of the flesh the reasonings of the mind and the last of our own will we will speak evil but if we allow the Spirit of God to release the truth, to release the love, the compassion, the kindness of God, then we will speak good because God is good. These people that God is calling to give them his power for the end times are people that walk in life without jealousy or bitter envy. People that they are not worried about who has what and what kind or amount of anointing so and so has. And they start coveting somebody else's anointing, somebody else's power. We should never covet what someone else has. Our coveting should be only directed to what the Lord Jesus has to give. Because everything else will come short of his glory. So there is no need to be jealous. There is no need to be envious. These people know who gives them power. These people know who is the source of life for them. These people know who their master is. James 3.13 Am I boring you? Should we finish here? Or should we go a little bit further? Pastor? People? Are you okay? Should we stop here? Come on, lift up the hands if we should stop here. Are you sure? Okay. James 3, 13 to 18, he says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by his good life his works in meekness, meekness, Meekness of wisdom. He who has true wisdom from above also will be accompanied by meekness. The proud cannot show true wisdom because the proud seeks his own glory. But the truly wise man of God or woman of God 
will seek God's glory. And he says, but if you have bitter jealousy and envy, factions in your heart, glory not. And lie not against the truth. This wisdom is not the wisdom that comes down from heaven. But is earthly, is sensual, and is devilish or satanic. For, they were, for where jealousy and factions are, there is confusion and every vile deed. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, easy to entreat, full of mercy and good fruits, without change and without hypocrisy. And the fruits of righteousness is sown in peace for them that make peace. So the true wisdom from above is about peaceful living among men. Having no hypocrisy, no saying, oh, God bless you, brother. And inside we are saying something else. It's not about saying, oh, how happy I am that you got a new house and a new car. Oh, I rejoice with you. And inside your heart are saying, I wonder whether you really earned it. God knows the thoughts of man. But if you're one of these people, if you are willing to be one of them, God's grace will fall upon you. And all these jealousies and envy will be far away from you the moment you say, yes, Lord. And no hypocrisy will dwell in your heart anymore. You will tell the truth. And when you speak the truth, you will say it with such a love and compassion, such a mindfulness to hurt people with the truth. They are willing to fall and be broken into pieces in the rock through repentance, the rock of our salvation. No wanting the authority for their own glory, but that men should know the glory of God. So brothers and sisters, we should ask ourselves even right now, what do I want the power and authority of God in this earth for? For people to know that I am powerful? For people to pat my back and say, well done? For people to come and glorify me and lift me up and say, what a great person I am? Or for people to come and say, what a great God you serve. Make up your mind. Make up your mind, beloved. We all have to make up our mind. Why do we want this power? Because the desire that we have for this power might either qualify us or disqualify us. But God wants us to have. He wants to empower us all. But gives the right of choice to every man and woman. That's why in the parable of the vineyard, when God gives the vineyard to some tenants, and when he comes for the fruits, they kill the servants then he sends more servants, they kill the servants again. Then he sends the son, representing the Lord Jesus coming to this world. They kill him too. So what does God ought to do? Let's read Matthew 21, 42. Jesus said unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same was made the head of the corner. This was from the Lord, and it is marvelous in your eyes. And in the same chapter, the next two verses, therefore says 
eye unto you. The kingdom of God shall be taken away from you. It shall be given to a nation bringing, or oh, group of people, bringing forth the fruit thereof. And he that falls unto this stone shall be broken to pieces. But on whosoever this stone shall fall, it will scatter them like dust. What is God saying? God is saying, I will come and I will require the fruits of what I've been teaching you. I will require the fruits of my spirit in you. Love and peace and joy and goodness, faithfulness, self-control and on. I want my fruits. But if we have nothing to give, if we refuse to enter in and allow the soil of my heart to become a, a, a soil that is fertilized, a soil that is so fertile for the gifts and for the fruits of the Spirit to develop within us, we'll have nothing to give God or to give man. And for them, God says, the kingdom of God shall be taken away from you. And I shall give to others and bring, they will bring fruits thereof. The kingdom of God means the authority to rule on the earth with Christ Jesus. As the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is within us. So that within us, that authority will be taken away from us. We will walk and we will cast demons and we will play for the sick. And guess what? Nothing happened. Are we familiar with that in the body of Christ? In many corners of the body of Christ, we are familiar with that. This is the root of the cause. Dear beloved, it is better to bow down and confess to the Lord. It is better to repent and change our minds when there is still time. Falling onto the rock of our salvation and to be broken into pieces. Our heart broken before the Lord. That to be made like power and dust by him falling with his fury and taking away from within us the kingdom, the power to rule. The power comes for them. That they are humble. For them that are willing to allow God to produce good fruits inside of our hearts. These people will be uncompromising in their obedience till the end. God gave a covenant to Aaron. And he says you will have no inheritance like the Israelites do. I will be your inheritance. And the Israelites will give the 10%. And he speaks to him, and this is the covenant of soul that I make forever. God is given a covenant of salt. Salt representing authority and the power of God unto man to operate as Christ did over the earth. But if we do not walk in obedience to God, that authority of the kingdom will be removed from us. And instead of us treading over our enemies, scorpions and snakes, the scorpions and snakes will tread over us. Mark 
uh, sorry, um, Luke 10, 19, it says, I have given you authority to trample against the snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the powers of the enemy and nothing by any means shall ever hurt you. That's the power he's giving. We can have it right now. We could have had it last year. We could have walked in it. It's there. That's the power. But if we lose the salt, if we lose the flavor, then we won't trample against the enemy. The enemy trample against us. And this is also happening in the body of Christ. So what makes us lose our saltiness? What makes us lose the flavor? Disobedience to the law of love. Let me give you the scripture. I'm jumping a little bit here and there because I'm running out of time. In the Amplified Bible, it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, the strength, and its quality, how can it saltless be restored? It is not good for anything any longer, but to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. That's very clear. So, saltiness is obedience to be kind to the needy, to be merciful to those that need mercy, to be forgiving to those that do wrong to us, to give shelter to those that have no shelter, to take a cloak and cover those that are cold and food to the hungry, to show true love, and we can all learn a little bit more about it. I am learning. And I'm sure you are learning. But God will complete it as we meditate in his word. Many people are disappointed with the carnal church nowadays. Deep inside their hearts, they are looking for more. Isn't that true? But be of good cheer because the Lord is about to do something extraordinary in the church. The church will change. There will be shift in the church. There will be shift in the economy. There will be shift in the life of many. There will be changes and shift over the nations. God is about to bring transformation to nations. A new chapter in our lives. So now, I want to say this. I was greatly inspired by hearing the prophecy of the man of God and prophet, Sadhu Sundar Salvaraj. And the things he said the most touching to my heart was a promise that throughout the year 2018, if we hold on tight to this promise, if we execute this promise and declare this promise over our life, we will get whatsoever we say. And this promise is in Isaiah 49 verse 17. He says, your children, in other translations, says, are the, the builders. Your builders make haste. 
your destroyers and those devastation who laid you waste go forth from you. In other words, uh, I read many translations, but in what it says, God is releasing his angels and his saints, and I saw today in the worship there were some angels and saints from heaven present here to witness, to write down everything that took place and is taking place and is being recorded for heaven. God is sending angels and saints to assist us to rebuild the temple within us, to build the promises of God and the destiny we are called into our lives. And he's saying, whatsoever was used by the enemy to destroy every dream, to destroy everything God has planted in us, to destroy the plans of God in our life, our walk, to devastate, and to bring to waste whatsoever it was good in our life. The anointings, the crowns, the giftings, the ministries, whatsoever God has planned in heaven to be fulfilled on this earth, but was intercepted, hindered, bringing destruction, devastation, and waste in our life, those are going to be removed from us. Amen. I will pronounce these words as many times as possible throughout this year. Because I am a witness myself of the destroyers and the devastators that came to steal from my life, from my calling, from my husband's calling, from the church, and for the plans God had for the church. All those emissaries of the enemy will be removed and we will know them no more. And in your life, whatever you felt that was stolen from you, whatever you felt that was taken away from you, whatever you felt that is no more in your life that it was a good thing, God is intending to restore it. God is intending to rebuild it, not in your own ways but in his way. So, I'd like to pray for you. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. We ask you, Lord, like, like arrows of fire will go forth and touch the life of whosoever is listening to this word that they may be blessed abundantly, that every chain may be broken from their minds and their hearts. Every lie will be destroyed by the light of your word. Lord, I pray that the builders of each and every one of those believers that are here, and even those that have not known you or believed on you, but they are being touched by your word. They're saying, I do want that God of you. I do want that Jesus. I do want that life. I'm tired of my own life. If you bow down and you say, Lord Jesus, I want you in my life. Change my life. Rebuild it. Make it worthy of you. God, send the angels. That in a tangible way, everyone that is listening will be touched and transformed. 
that the work inside the heart will begin to manifest. That the destroyers of those which is good, the devastations that brought to waste every good thing you gave to them and every good thing you built in them and the destiny you had for them. Remove them in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Father, that you will send the weapons of our warfare and your angels from heaven to tear down every stronghold, to bring force victory in Christ Jesus over every life, that every veil from the eyes of your people be removed and that your spirit will enlighten by your wisdom and the spirit of revelation everyone's eyes to know you as you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening and God bless you.